Hello and welcome to this film about processing data with errors. It's almost the last of the introductory films at the start of the IB chemistry course and um, it follows on from the film where we looked at what errors were and what significant figures were. So in this particular film we'll be seeing what happens to those errors when we start calculating other values. And hopefully you'll understand the difference between what we mean by a, an absolute error and a relative error or relative and absolute uncertainties and you'll know which of those two errors or uncertainties to use when you're calculating a new value and you will base that decision on what type of calculation it is you're doing and then finally we'll look have a look at which piece of data we're going to use to decide how precise our final answer can be okay now what's the difference between absolute and relative uncertainties well to cut a long story short absolute uncertainties never change for a certain piece of equipment, whereas relative uncertainties can. Let's have a look at why that is. Well, let's say I measured the mass of a person on this um, kitchen scales, on these <laughs> bathroom scales, and um, I discovered that there were 50 kilograms, okay, and that the manufacturer of these scales had told me that there was a one kilogram uncertainty in any reading I made. And it wouldn't matter if I uh, weighed a 10 kilogram person or a 100 kilogram person, they'd always be plus or minus one kilogram. And this is the absolute uncertainty. Okay, I could weigh a five gram object on this balance. I might discover that it weighed exactly five grams according to this balance. And as we've said before, um, the uncertainty in this reading is down to the fact that the balance is having to do some rounding, and we're going to take half that last decimal place. So here's our absolute error for that reading. Now, how do we find a relative error, and how is it different? Well, it's different because it can change in size depending on the size of the reading that I've made. The relative error is often quoted as a percentage, and it's found by taking the absolute error and dividing it by the actual measurement that you've just made. Okay, so there's a formula for finding it, multiplied by 100% because we're trying to find a percentage. Okay, what would one kilogram B as a percentage of 50, well it's 1 over 50 times 100 and that's 2%. So the relative error in this measurement is 50, well sorry, the measurement is 50 kilograms and the relative error is plus or minus 2%. And hopefully you can see that if I had made a measurement of 100 kilograms, this relative error would be much smaller, it would only be 1%. And hence the reason why we always try and make a big measurement if we can, because then the absolute error in our equipment turns into a smaller relative error. What's the relative error here? Well, we put in this very small number up the top and this relatively large number down the bottom, and we do this calculation again, and we would find that we've got a mass of 5.0000 grams, plus or minus. 0.001%. So that's a very, very small absolute error. But if I'd weighed or recorded the mass of an object that only weighed 0.001 grams, then this absolute error would become quite significant. In other words, the relative error would be much, much larger than it would be when I'm weighing a relatively large mass. Okay. So relative errors change in size depending on the size of the reading that I'm making, whereas absolute errors simply depend on the equipment that I'm using and they'll always be the same regardless of the measurement. Now it's important that we know what those two types of error are because depending on what type of mathematical operation I'm performing with my bits of data I will use different errors. Okay now let's say I wanted to find a temperature change in this beaker and I'm using this thermometer. I might discover that at the start of the experiment it uh, has a temperature of 20 degrees centigrade and at the end 25 degrees centigrade. Okay, now let's say that the manufacturer of this thermometer said that there was an absolute error of plus or minus 0.1 of a degree centigrade. Okay, now let's have a think about what I'm going to do here if I'm going to find the temperature change. Well, I'm going to subtract 20 from 25. Okay, so I'm going to get a temperature change of 5 degrees centigrade. Okay, but what are the maximum minimum values I could get? Well, this could be as much as 25.1 and as little as 24.9. This one could be as little as much as 
and as little as 19.9. And if we think about it now, the biggest temperature change I could get would be 5.2 degrees. And the smallest change I could get for these readings would be 4.8 degrees centigrade. And hopefully you can see what's happened here. I've got a difference or an error uncertainty in my reading of plus or minus 0.2 degrees centigrade. So what have I done? I've taken my absolute errors and added them together to give me an error in my final reading. I could turn this into a relative error in my final answer, but what am I doing when I'm adding and subtracting two different values? I am adding the two absolute errors together. Let's say I'd been recording the mass of some object. Let's say I weighed it out in a weighing boat, and the weighing boat with the object weighed 11.0 grams, and without anything in it, it weighed 1.0 grams. Again, we've got an absolute error in our readings here, and it's going to be half that last decimal place, so plus or minus 0 0.05 grams in both cases. These are our absolute errors. So what is the mass of the object that I weighed out? Well, it's 10 grams, 10.0 grams, in fact. 10.0 grams plus or minus. Well, what have I done here? I've used my data. These are the two figures that I've used here. Okay, and I've subtracted one from the other. So I'm adding together my absolute errors and finding that my overall error is plus or minus 0.1 gram. Okay, now... Things get very different if we're multiplying or dividing experiment. Now, you might do an experiment sometime where you're trying to find the uh, heat energy change, so delta H, and you might do that by multiplying the mass of a substance that changes in temperature by its heat capacity by the change in temperature. Now, we've just decided, let's not do the whole thing again, that this had changed in temperature by 5 degrees centigrade plus or minus 0.2 degrees centigrade, okay? And that the mass of the, mass of the water, let's say, that I'd used here was 10.0 grams plus or minus 0.1 of a gram. Was it? Wasn't it? Yes. Okay. Now, if I wanted to multiply these two values together, the mass and the temperature change, then I have to turn these two things into percentage errors first, okay, or relative errors. So let's see what the relative error is here. Well, that's 4% of that. I could use the formula to find that out, but this is basically 5 degrees centigrade plus or minus 4%. Okay, what's this percentage error here? Well, it's 1%, so this is 10.0 grams plus or minus 1%. Okay. This value here, which we don't need to remember for now, but it was it's 4.18 joules per Kelvin per gram. Okay, this is a data book value, and as such, we treat it as if it doesn't have any error in it. Okay, so if I'm trying to calculate the, my heat energy change, let's not bother with any units here. I'm going to take the mass, which is 10.0. I'm going to multiply it by 4.18. And I'm going to multiply that by 5 degrees centigrade. Okay, and I'm going to get a value of 209, and it would be joules as it happens, but we're not fussed about that for now. Okay, 209 would be my final answer. I've multiplied together two different values that had errors in them, so I have to add together their relative errors, not their absolute errors. Plus 5% on this occasion. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at how precise our calculated answer can be based on the data that I'm using to calculate it. Okay, now let's say that I had used two different balances to record the mass of two different objects. And let's say that this one had told me that the first object weighed 2.0 grams because this balance weighs two. one decimal place. And that this one had told me that some other object weighed 0.0. .0 two zero zero grams okay now what am I going to do if I want to find the sum of these two masses well if I'm finding the sum of two masses or the sum of any two things or if I'm subtracting things then 
my answer can only be given to the same number of decimal places as the piece of data with fewest decimal places. Okay? So if I'm adding or subtracting, I base the precision of my answer on the number of decimal places in my data. Okay, so this number's only got one decimal place, this one's got four. Okay, so because I have no idea whether this number is actually um, 1.95 as a minimum or 2.05 as a maximum, this number here is pretty insignificant. Okay, so if I was adding these two masses together, I could only say that my answer would be 2.0 grams because I can only use one decimal place because my weakest piece of data, I suppose you could say, or the piece of data with fewest decimal places has only one decimal place. If I'm multiplying these two masses together, and I've got no idea why you might want to find the product of two masses, but let's say you did, okay, then you're going to look at significant figures. So anytime we multiply or divide, we have to look at the data and decide how many significant figures there are in it. Okay, now let's just have a look at these two pieces of data. One of them is 2.0 times 10 to the naught, okay, it's got two significant figures. This one here is 2.00 times 10 to the minus 2, so this is three significant figures. If I was going to multiply these two numbers together, I'd be having to give the same number of significant figures in my answer as the piece of data with fewest significant figures. So two significant figures is what my answer is going to have to be. If I multiply these two together, I get four. Point naught, remember, two significant figures times 10 to the minus 2. Okay, so that's what we do with significant figures and decimal places when we're adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing. And this is how we decide how precise an answer we can quote when we're taking our data and turning it into new values. Okay, um, so hopefully um, you have achieved the objectives that we set out at the start of this film and that you understand how to do these things. If you've got any questions, please feel free to come and ask, or even better, post a comment on YouTube so that everyone can see your questions.